an official message from Medicare. Did you try it yet? Comparing plans? 62 million older adults and people with disabilities should be online shopping right now. I found lower premiums. And lower prescription costs. It's open enrollment, the one window each year when every single person on Medicare can change their coverage. Comparing plans really pay. But research shows just three in 10 people shop around. It's exhausting. It's tedious. We listen to bad music as we were put on hold. And even when they do, people often pick plans that hurt their wallets and potentially their health. Today, why millions of Americans are stuck in a cycle making dangerously bad Medicare enrollment decisions and what we could do about it. From the studio at the Leonard Davis Institute at the University of Pennsylvania, I'm Dan Gorenstein, and this is Tradeoffs. Okay, tell me wh- which plan you're in now. It's it's not the very cheapest one. It's the next one up. It's. Does it have a name? Yeah. You want me to tell you what it is? I do. (laughs) Come on, Trish, you know how old I am? On the 18th floor of her downtown Philadelphia high-rise, Lillian Grossman is finally getting around to doing what she'd put off for years, seeing if she can get a better deal than the $6,000 plus a year that she's paying for three kinds of Medicare coverage. She's called in a family friend via Zoom to help, and she's agreed to let us sit in. It would be awesome to get all the medicines from your medicine cabinet that you might need to refill over the course of a year. Okay, then hang on a minute and I'll, I'll get that stuff. The 87-year-old with more salt than pepper in her hair eases out of her kitchen chair and heads towards her bedroom. As she searches through her stuff. Lil lines up her six medications as she sits back down. Okay. Now we get to a slightly painful part where I'm going to be typing in each of your drugs. She squints so from behind her red glasses, Two, reading three, the labels four, one by five. one. Okay, Carvedilol, C-A-R-V-E-D-I-L-O-L. What's your dose level? 6.25. Hydrochlorothiazide. Hydro. Do you take the generic of that? Chloro. C-H-L-O-R. How long does this inhaler last you? O-T-H. Does it end with Z-I-D-E? Z-I-D-E, yeah. The family friend guiding Lil on the other end of the line through this tedious process is not just some nice lady. Joining us now is Trisha Newman of the Kaiser Family Foundation. Trisha Newman is a widely cited Medicare policy expert. The font of an enormous amount of important research and reports. Trisha Newman. She's also a guest lecturer at Harvard's Kennedy School. Trisha Newman is one of the nation's top Medicare minds. And to be honest, it's kind of surprising someone like her paused through the medicine cabinets of her family and friends, spends hours on hold with health insurers, but she's helped people like Lil navigate Medicare's enrollment maze about two dozen times now. She does this work because Trisha and her colleagues at the Kaiser Family Foundation know it can pay off. We just did a study and 70% of all people in Medicare did not compare their plans in a recent open enrollment period There are a lot of people who are spending hundreds of dollars more than necessary because the process is just too challenging. Those hundreds of dollars can mean a lot to a senior on a fixed income, deciding between seeing the doctor, going to the grocery store, and living in a safe apartment. Unfortunately, Tricia says millions of Americans are in suboptimal Medicare plans. But people often have no clue because after they enroll for the first time, they rarely shop again. And the people least likely to shop are those who could benefit the most, people with low incomes and less education and people of color. One big reason, too many choices. Next year in Philadelphia, people will have a choice of more than 50 Medicare Advantage plans, more than 20 standalone drug plans. It's 
almost imponderable how many options people have out there. Call it the Amazonification of the Medicare market. Pages and pages of products with few clear ways to compare them. Medicare looked a lot different 20 years ago. Most people didn't think about it because Medicare was relatively easy. They turned 65, they automatically went on Medicare. There wasn't really this marketplace dynamic that we see today. That marketplace now includes a prescription drug benefit known as Part D and an alternative to traditional Medicare known as Medicare Advantage. Both options are run by private insurers who compete fiercely for seniors' business. Their growth really began to soar, says Tricia, after 2003 when Congress passed the Medicare Modernization Act. And the idea was to give people more choice, but over time things have gotten more complex. The theoretical value of all these choices is not matching up to the reality of what people actually do. That's certainly played out for Lil. If you sit down and start looking across those pages and trying to compare those plans, it makes you crazy. It really does. That's why she called Trisha in the first place. She kind of assumed she wasn't in the best plan, but just wasn't sure. There's so much information here that it's really, really hard to understand what it is you're getting, what it is you're paying for, how protected you are, and what's the point of having all these plans in front of you when you have no idea what any of them cost comparatively. I mean, how, how do you evaluate that? Lil appreciated what Trisha was doing for her. After dealing with Lil's prescription drugs, Trisha asked Lil to call the insurance company that runs her Medigap plan. That's the plan that covers the costs that Medicare doesn't. Last year, Lil paid more than $4,000 in premiums, and Trisha thought they could save some serious money there. This call will be monitored and recorded for quality purposes. Please stay on the line. As the customer service team looked up Lil's other options, we heard, arguably, some of the most ominous healthcare hold music around. When the sales rep came back, Trisha pounced. Do you have plan D as in dog? No, I got A as in Alpha, B as in Boy, C as in Charlie, F, F as in Frank, G as in Goat, K as in Kilo, L as in Lima, and N as in November. The sales rep volleyed back his own series of questions about Lil's health history. Now, within the past two years, did a medical professional tell you that you may need any of the following? Organ transplant? No. Okay, thank you. Back or spine surgery? Pre-existing conditions can still spike costs in this corner of the insurance market, making comparing plans even more complicated. Heart or vascular surgery? No. After an exhausting 50 minutes on the phone, plus another 40 sorting through her prescriptions, Trisha had found Lil new plans that would save her about $2,000 next year, nearly a third of her total annual health insurance costs. But Lil wasn't ready to pull the trigger, telling Trisha she needed the next few days to think about it. Okay, thanks Bye, a lot. Thanks a lot, sweetie. Bye. Lil was tired, frustrated, and worried. 2000 bucks was a sizable chunk of money, but she was weighing it against something else she really valued that's hard to put a price tag on. You know, you get to a stage in life where it's just easier to stay where you are. I, I've got the system, and it works, and I'm comfortable. A plan switch, even the most expertly researched one, comes with a lot of unknowns, new hoops to jump through, fine print you might have missed. A lot of the 62 million people on Medicare share Lil's fears, but research suggests staying put is riskier than it seems. Those consequences and whether Lil switches plans after the break. Welcome back. We're in the midst of open enrollment season, 
the one chance every year for the 62 million Americans on Medicare to shop for cheaper, better coverage. Before the break, we heard from Medicare expert Trisha Newman about how more and more private plans have entered this market, giving people an unprecedented number of choices. We wanted to know what the evidence shows. Do all of those offerings make people more likely to find a plan that better suits their needs? Really, what are the costs and benefits of having so many options? So we turn to this guy. Okay, so my name is Amal Trivedi. I am a professor of health services policy and practice at Brown University. He's also a doctor, and he's a big fan of JAM. Arguably the most famous study that's been done that ever looked at this phenomenon of how sometimes more choices don't lead to better decisions uh, is a study of, of uh, JAMs in a supermarket in Northern California. And the researchers were really clever. They uh, put out either six jams in that supermarket, or they went back and laid out 24 jams. And what they found, surprisingly, is that the supermarkets sold a lot more jams when there were just six. Now that goes contrary to economic theory. Usually, more choice is better. If there's somebody out there who only wants rhubarb, then having 24 that includes the rhubarb would get you more customers. But they didn't find that. They found that uh, people were likely to not choose a jam when there were 24 on the display counter. I feel obliged to ask, is there really just rhubarb jam? I've never seen that in my life. <laughs> the reason I thought of that is that this was a pretty upscale supermarket. So I figured uh, this might be some sort of artisanal choice that might have been available. So, you know, I'm a straight up grape jam guy, but I was trying to envision the context. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty ridiculous, Amal. So I, I think what you're saying here is that one downside to all of these choices is that people just walk away. We also know, though, that even when folks do shop, they don't usually do a very good job. There's one study that found nearly three quarters of the time, I think, seniors failed to pick the lowest cost prescription drug plan and spent like 25% more than they needed to. So how big of a deal is leaving money on the table like that? Well, let's, let's first think through what is the typical financial situation for a senior? The median income is $27,000 a year. And a lot of seniors, they live on a fixed income, trading off between you know, their out-of-pocket costs for healthcare, their heating bills and food bills. And sometimes it's really hard to figure out what types of services should you continue to pay the co-pays for and which ones you should cut down on. And do we actually have evidence about what kinds of care seniors cut back on when they're faced with these tough choices, Amal? There is a large literature on the impact of even modest co-payments for seniors on the use of high-value, effective healthcare services. Things like cancer screenings, seeing primary care doctors to manage chronic conditions, taking medications that prevent cardiovascular disease, and the seniors who are more likely to cut back are those who are living in poverty. And that could have downstream effects on health. So part of what you're telling me is if seniors are facing some sort of financial squeeze because they're picking a, a plan that's more expensive than they need to. They have less money to purchase their prescriptions or go see their uh, primary care provider. That could lead them to cutting back on care and could ultimately really compromise their health. That's exactly right. So we actually did a study looking at what happens when seniors' co-pays for doctor visits went up even slightly. Uh, and what we found is, is that seniors didn't just cut back on the number of doctor visits. They were actually more likely to show up in the hospital. And what that means is that uh, skimping on even simple things like um, seeing a regular doctor uh, can have serious health consequences. Amal, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us on Tradeoffs. Really appreciate it. 
This is great. Thanks so much. The kind of evidence Amal is talking about helps us appreciate what's at stake if people pick the wrong Medicare plan. But changing plans can be scary. That's what had left Lil Grossman feeling torn when we last spoke to her. So we called her back to see where she landed. Hi, thank you. Hi, how are you today? I'm, I'm doing okay. How are you doing? Okay, I'm okay. So Lil, after all that terrible hold music, all the data entry and help from Trisha, what did you decide? Well, after, after cogitating for a few days, I, I guess, you know, at this stage of life, it, it's just, it's like too much. Lil told us she actually came inches away from changing Medigap plans. But then things got complicated. It turns out there's a little kicker. The price that sales rep originally quoted Lil hadn't properly accounted for a pre-existing lung condition she has. And even though the insurer has covered Lil for years with this condition, and it's never sent her to the hospital, switching plans would have meant a big bump to her premium. So that was the end of that. This whole ordeal has affirmed Lil's fears. Her lack of trust that this whole process is worth the hassle. Trisha's offered to help Lil look again next year, but unless her costs explode, Lil has said she plans to stay put. After this experience, you know, it was like, when you just leave well enough alone, it's not that horrible. You know what you got, they take care of you. That's it. Trisha was disappointed, but not surprised. A lot of people just kind of tighten their belts and make do because they feel the juice isn't worth the squeeze and they just, you know, let it ride. But all that inertia takes a toll on the millions of people on Medicare who are in frail health and have tight finances. The good news? With regard to uh, Medigap, the House uh, Ways and Means provision. This is a problem Congress has tackled before, back in 1990. The language in most insurance policies is often ambiguous and difficult to understand. That's when Congress stepped in to simplify the marketplace for Medigap, the supplemental insurance that Tricia recently helped Lil shop for. Consumer advocates had raised alarm bells about how confusing the marketplace was becoming, and then members of Congress kind of took it up and and ran with it. Lawmakers forced private insurers who, by that point, were offering hundreds of different Medigap packages to whittle their wares down to just 10 standard options, generically labeled A through J. So a Plan G from Aetna came with the same benefits as a Plan G from United Healthcare, and consumers could make apples to apples comparisons. But that was the Medicare of 31 years ago. Over time, things have gotten more complex with so many plans offered across the country and so that individuals have not only a choice of Medicare HMOs and PPOs, but also dozens of Part D prescription drug plans. Tricia said lawmakers could dust off their Medigap reform playbook, try to shrink and standardize these new offerings, but that would likely face pushback from all of those private insurers Congress invited to the party back in 2003 with that Medicare modernization bill. Tricia says there is some merit to this argument. Insurers do offer a huge variety of benefits not included in traditional Medicare, like dental and vision coverage, even meal delivery. There really are trade-offs between giving plans flexibility to offer innovative benefits versus making the benefits more readily comparable. People do like choice, and the benefits of choice is you can decide whether or not you want more generous or less generous coverage. You can sort of dial up or down with premiums. So there is some advantage to having multiple options. The question is, how many do you really need? So far, advocacy groups have told us there seems to be little appetite in Congress for some 1990s-style reform. But there are still steps Congress could take. First, invest more money in navigation programs known as SHIPS. Those are programs that train volunteers to do essentially what Trisha does for her friends and family. And second, limit how much financial damage one bad plan choice can do by capping out-of-pocket spending across Medicare. 
Until there's some action, Amo and Trisha worry for the physical and financial health of the millions of Americans who do shop for Medicare plans and the millions who don't. I'm Dan Gorenstein, and this is Tradeoffs. Seventy percent of people on Medicaid actually get coverage through private insurers. It's called Medicaid Managed Care, and the idea was to reduce Medicaid spending while increasing access and quality. So, has it worked? We return to the research corner to dig into the evidence next time on Tradeoffs. If you enjoyed today's episode of Tradeoffs, don't keep it to yourself. Tell someone else about it. Friend, colleague, family member, give us a shout on Twitter at TradeoffsPod, and we'd be eternally grateful if you gave us a rating on whichever podcast app you use. The Tradeoffs team is producers Ryan Levy, Chief of Strategy and Operations, Jessica Silverman, Communications Manager Nora Tahiri, Operations Assistant Jamie Song, Sound Designer Andrew Perella, and Senior Producer Leslie Walker. The Tradeoffs theme song was composed by Ty Sitterman with additional music this episode from Blue Dot Sessions. Additional thanks to Jason Abeluk, Sorb Bargava, Sanchol Park, Frederick Riccardi, and Anna Sineko. Thanks also to all our listeners who helped to support our work, including Linda Roberts, Andrew Livengood, and Erica Brown. Tradeoffs is supported in part by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Arnold Ventures, the Leonard Davis Institute of Health Economics at the University of Pennsylvania, West Health, the California Healthcare Foundation, and the National Institute for Healthcare Management. The views expressed in this episode are those of the individuals and not those of Tradeoff staff, advisors, or funders. <laughs>